Bitcoin hits a fresh all-time high of more than $81,000 as investors remain optimistic about a second Trump term. More than 100 world leaders are gathering in Baku to discuss actions towards tackling the climate crisis. And can China's $1.4 trillion stimulus revive its slowing economy? Hello, I'm Tabor Aydin with the latest business and finance news here on TRT World. Cryptocurrencies extended their rally with Bitcoin hitting a new all-time high on Monday. Bitcoin soared to over $81,000 on expectations that cryptocurrencies will boom in a favourable regulatory environment following Donald Trump's election victory. Meanwhile, Ether rose to over $3,000, while smaller coins saw bigger moves as investors continued to digest the implications of a second Trump term. Let's get more on this now with Tim Waterer in Sydney. He's Chief Market Analyst at KCM Trade. Good to have you with us, Tim. Firstly, what's led to this massive rally in cryptos? Good to be with you again. Yeah, that's right. Quite a, a reaction in to the, uh, the election last week, across all markets really, and crypto in particular. And I think it really uh, comes down to, I guess, a lot of the, the policy aspects in play uh, from the Trump administration. Uh, and it really stems from like a deregulation stance, which applies to the broader financial market industry, as well as to the, uh, the crypto space as well. And of course, let's not forget, there was a big backer of Trump during the presidential campaign, that was Elon Musk who's very involved with cryptocurrencies himself. Some of that may have rubbed off on Trump as well. So there's a feeling that there will be, I guess, uh, less of a stringent regulatory requirement on the crypto industry uh, under a Trump presidency uh, with Musk at his side, potentially in an administration role. Let's see how that pans out. So that's what really, uh, you know, sent other crypto bulls into overdrive uh, in the aftermath of the election last week. And President-elect Trump has promised to make America the crypto capital of the world. How realistic is that, given his previous stance on cryptocurrencies? Yeah, that will be interesting to see how what you know how that pans out. Um, because on the one hand, like uh, President-elect Trump, he's very against like a central bank digital currency. He's not a big fan of that. Uh, but at the same time, he does support, I guess, this uh, the idea of you know this, this crypto. Uh, world basically gaining influence uh, in the uh, you know in America uh, and across the world as well, and he's even talking about having like a reserve of crypto currency as well. So I mean, as we talked about you know just before, I think he's certainly got some some backers in Elon Musk uh, close to him that would support that. There's still going to be some hurdles um, in terms of the uh, you know the, the financial regulatory bodies over there. I think we could see a little bit of pushback. But, um, you know, I think even if it gets, you know, some, some movement, I guess, based on the, the stricter, you know, regime that was due to be brought in for crypto, even if it gets some movement on there to the downside, then I think, yeah, he can make some uh, progress there, which could support further gains in the, uh, in the crypto market. But, um, yeah, a lot is still to play out there uh, in coming months as we get a better idea of, I guess, you know, whether there's any gap between expectations for what happens and reality, uh, you know, when there might be some of that pushback, as I said, from the... Uh, the regulatory bodies. And how will this affect Trump's policies and potential trade wars with countries like China? So that's the big unknown at the moment. I mean, there's been a lot of, I guess, enthusiasm across risk assets over the past week. You know, I guess, you know, the corporate sector is liking what they're hearing in terms of a deregulatory environment uh, combined with, you know, cuts to the, uh, the corporate tax rate uh, as well as other key tax rates as well. So that's, that's pro-growth. Um, you would have to say, but there's also an inflationary component, as you mentioned there, with a the potential, you know, uh, escalation of uh, trade tensions with China. Now, of course, he's floated around at this figure of 60% potentially on Chinese imports into the US. We'll have to see where that figure lands. I'm sure there'll be some negotiations. We'll have to see whether that comes in, you know, above 50% or, or less than 50%, depending on how the uh, the negotiations go. But I think that's that's something that uh, investors are keeping in the back of their minds now is that, OK, yes, things are looking pretty good on the pro-growth side, but uh, there is this little bit of a cloud hanging over the market in terms of how this uh, you know, potential trade war, high tariffs on China, how that could transpire. Because if you do tax uh, Chinese imports at you know, 60%, 50% even, 
that can have a knock-on effect around the globe because that can really crimp Chinese growth. Uh, and uh, that could, uh, of course, you know, have negative repercussions for Asian markets. So uh, that's something to consider moving forward. But, uh, yeah, hopefully we've got some clarification on where things stand on that uh, potential trade war front uh, in the coming months. All right, Tim Water, we will have to leave it there. Thank you very much for that analysis. Thank you. Representatives from almost every country in the world are gathering in Azerbaijan for the annual UN summit on the climate crisis. Starting from Monday, the 29th session known as COP29 will last for 12 days and during this time, world leaders and experts will discuss ways to protect the environment. TRT World's Hassan Abdullah is there. Azerbaijan's capital, Baku, is set to host heads of states and governments as well as ministers and technical experts from around the world. The Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP29, first formed nearly three decades ago. The primary topic on this year's agenda is cutting down global carbon emissions. Among the participating leaders is Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. We will accelerate the green transformation process in our industry with the climate law. Our work continues on establishing an emissions trading system. We will support the transformation of our industry and increase our competitiveness by encouraging all kinds of innovations that reduce our carbon footprint. Turkey has set a net zero carbon emissions target for 2053. But for some countries, embarking on a greener path is more challenging. A case in point is Azerbaijan, where oil and gas account for nearly 75% of the country's GDP and 90% of its exports. The government here says it's working to reduce the carbon footprint. But with such heavy reliance on fossil fuels, it's easier said than done. Azerbaijan seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2050. However, many representatives from the Global South say some of the biggest polluters are Western nations who don't practice what they preach. US President-elect Donald Trump has earlier promised to take his country out of the Paris Climate Agreement again. He had done so after his first election as well. Donald Trump has a specific strategy for uh, the United States. He thinks that United Sta States shouldn't be um, committed uh, itself to the restrictions of uh, this regime, but uh, it has been supportive of other countries, uh, developed and developing countries, to contribute to this process. At COP29, delegates from around the world will once again negotiate international agreements and commitments to combat the climate crisis and ways to offer more support to the developing countries. Many here are wondering if the process will suffer in the coming years with the rise of right-wing populism and climate crisis deniers. Especially with US President-elect Donald Trump repeatedly calling climate change a hoax. Hassan Abdullah, TRT World, Baku. Hassan Abdullah joins us live from Baku now. Hi Hassan, firstly, what are some of the main goals of this year's summit and what are the main challenges in reaching new funding at COP29? Well, Tayyip, I've been talking to quite a few delegates here, especially delegates from various African countries, and they have been talking about their concerns and their priorities. So, for example, they're saying that one of the issues they hope is going to be addressed, at least to a certain extent, at this particular summit is the recurring issue of pledges versus reality. So, for example, you've got developed countries that have pledged around $100 billion a year for the developing countries, but many of those pledges have never materialized. That's a major concern at this summit. They're going to be talking about the inefficiencies when it comes to the coordination of diverse funding sources, for example, the public and private funds, various multilateral banking institutions and so forth. They believe there are huge inefficiencies that have to be addressed. That's going to be one of the topics on the agenda of discussion. Uh, they're also going to be talking about how to mobilize private sector financing. Uh, they are uh, going to talk about how the market me mechanism as well as these um, uncertain regulatory frameworks have an impact on financing from the private sector. So that's going to be on the agenda. There, of course, are concerns about the rise of the far right in the Western Hemisphere, and that, of course, relates 
to the issue of climate crisis denialism, the election of Donald Trump. Uh, that is a matter of concern for many people here, for many of the delegates I've talked to. Um, they're hoping that there are going to be steps taken to mitigate um, any negative consequences from that. Uh, also, one of the issues of concern for many of these delegates from the Global South is the issue of climate-induced debt. They're saying that many of their countries are already in huge debt, and the way this mechanism is working is basically placing more and more burden on them, uh, which they'll have to deal with in the coming decades. All right, Hassan, we will leave it there. Hassan Abdullah there in Baku, who will keep us up to date with the latest developments. Now a quick look at some of the other top business stories from around the world. Iran has begun nationwide rolling power blackouts due to a natural gas shortage ahead of winter, despite having the world's third largest oil and second largest gas reserves. Tehran, with a population of 9.5 million, will face daily two-hour outages. Years of underinvestment in electricity infrastructure and poor maintenance have led to frequent power cuts, especially during hot summer months when air conditioning uses spike. Vietnam has given Chinese online retailers Xi'an and Timu an ultimatum to register with the government by the end of November, or face having their internet domains and apps blocked in the country. The government and local businesses have raised concerns about the platform's impact on local markets due to deep discounting. Hurricane Rafael has caused major disruptions in the US Gulf of Mexico, knocking out more than a quarter of oil production and nearly 16% of natural gas output. On Sunday alone, about 500,000 barrels of oil and 310 million cubic feet of natural gas were offline. But there is some good news. Chevron and Shell are beginning to bring workers back to their offshore facilities and Shell has resumed operations of its drill ships. And China's consumer prices increased at the slowest pace in four months in October, while producer price deflation worsened. This came even as Beijing doubled down on stimulus measures to support the weakening economy. The consumer price index rose by 0.3% from a year earlier, down from a 0.4% rise in September and below forecasts. Still ahead on the programme, tech giants are cashing in on Trump's victory. But with political tensions in the mix, will this wealth wave last? We'll find out after this short break. The world's wealthiest individuals saw their fortunes skyrocket to record levels in the wake of Donald Trump's election victory. Unsurprisingly, it's US tech titans who came out on top. According to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, the combined wealth of the world's top 10 richest individuals soared by nearly $100 billion in the past week alone. The optimism swirling around Trump's anticipated policy agenda pushed stocks higher, fueling this significant increase in wealth. Many of these billionaires are expected to benefit from deregulation and tax cuts, which could unleash fresh waves of investment in their companies. Leading the pack was Elon Musk, whose fortune swelled by $50 billion, pushing his net worth past $300 billion for the first time. As a vocal supporter of Trump, Musk benefited from a sharp rise in Tesla's share price, where he holds a 13% stake as CEO of the electric car giant. The President-elect has hinted at a potential role for Musk in his administration, possibly appointing him as an efficiency czar to streamline government operations. Other big winners include Amazon's Jeff Bezos, who added another $7 billion to his nearly $230 billion fortune. Microsoft's Bill Gates, former CEO Steve Ballmer, and Google co-founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin also rode the market wave to grow their already massive fortunes. And Meta's Mark Zuckerberg faced a slight dip on the election day, but remained solidly in the top ranks with a net worth of $209 billion. 
However, his strained relationship with Trump remains a looming shadow. The president-elect has previously threatened legal action against Zuckerberg over alleged meddling during the 2020 election. Now, as China's economy struggles to grow, authorities there have announced a $1.4 trillion uh, stimulus package. The goal is to tackle local government's hidden debt, but with problems ranging from a slumping property sector and low consumer demand, will the measures work? Emre Boz reports. Row after row of apartments, but no buyers on the list. Scenes like this show physical signs of China's slowing economy, dealing with the housing crisis, huge private debt levels, declining consumer confidence and low production across a range of sectors. This is having an impact on your everyday worker. This year, I resigned from my previous company in April and I have sent out resumes during this period, but you can see it takes more than half a year to get a new job. There are not so many projects. With demand at all-time lows, people are now spending less and companies are unwilling to hire. This stagnation continues to lead to lower economic production. China's GDP growth rate has slumped this year, falling to 4.6 per cent year-on-year in the third quarter. And production in the manufacturing sector has been on a downward trend since the beginning of the year, posting a falling growth rate of 5.2 per cent in September. So what is the government doing to tackle the problem? Authorities have announced a $1.4 trillion stimulus package over three years. This $1.4 trillion in debt ceiling will be arranged over three years. $280 billion per year from 2024 to 2026 to support local governments in replacing all kinds of hidden debt. The goal is simple. Use central government bonds to get rid of local debt with central government aiming to help local authorities to swap their hidden debt. The move aims to boost investor confidence by increasing government oversight over local administrations. But analysts are skeptical, saying that such measures don't directly spur consumer demand, but just lead to more debt. China hopes to reach its growth target of 5% by the end of the year. But with GDP still going down, it's unlikely this deadline will be met with or without this latest measure. Emre Balls, TRT World. For more, we're joined by Victor Tio in Singapore. He's a political scientist and Indo-Pacific affairs analyst. Good to have you with us, Victor. Now, we've seen stocks across Asia fall as stimulus measures were largely underwhelming. Why wasn't it enough to restore confidence? Well, I think, uh, first of all, you have to understand that this stimulus is actually to help the local government uh, to have more breathing room. It's not meant to resolve all the problems at all once. Uh, and secondly, I think it's early days yet because they, the National People's Congress just uh, passed the bill. So I think it will take some time to have an effect. I think the question really for us is whether the benefit would distill down to um, to everybody at the grassroots level or it, will it be confined to just the governments and the larger firms? But by and large, I think there will be some effect. The question is how far this effect will go uh, for two reasons. First of all, I think uh, come this time, everybody will be more prudent in their spending, especially the local governments. And two, uh, the central government will be, will be watching very closely what the gov local governments are doing. So, but having said that, I think the situation will get better uh, because the people are actually very resilient. Uh, but people should not expect China to return to the heyday of yesteryears. Like that means like the 10 years ago, where there is a runway inflation and you know the economy is red hot and everybody's trading really well. Uh, but this actually uh, does not only have to do with what the Chinese are doing inside China. It has to do with the larger uh, global economic climate, uh, particularly uh, with uh, Donald Trump's uh, tariffs, uh, because they are, you know, the Chinese are actually watching this very carefully. And also because the traditional customers uh, of the Chinese manufacturing sector are themselves also in a bit of economic trouble. I'm talking about the United States, Western Europe, of course. Right. And as you say, this uh, fiscal package is largely aimed at restructuring uh, local uh, government debt. What challenges are local governments facing at the moment? Well, I think uh, this has to do with the way they approach development over the past uh, 30 or 40 years. So since the 1980s, uh, the, the local governments have gone hand in hand with the larger corporations in the, in the respective provinces and, and the cities where they are based to undertake 
development projects. So uh, I think a lot of these projects are real estate based. So estimate, we can estimate that the real estate sector accounts for about 30% of the, the GDP. Now, as we all know, the real estate uh, companies, especially the huge companies got in trouble. And this has created a knock, knock on effects on the companies and all those firms that are directly related to these large real estate companies. Uh, at, at the same time, the local governments, uh, many of them have actually also invested in these projects or have uh, interest in these projects. So they also have uh, their plans stalled. So um, I think uh, for a long while, everybody in China assumed that uh, real estate projects means quick money. So they were looking towards uh, places like Singapore and Hong Kong, where the land is scarce and real estate projects always, always make them a lot of money. But this is not turning out to be the case. Uh, so when COVID pandemic hit and the US-China trade war started, and these firms were, uh, you know, had overextended themselves and were going bust. So, but it's it's good in a, in a sense that uh, China has managed to arrest the kind of runaway inflation. And everybody now understands that real estate uh, investment should not be speculative because uh, there were a lot of speculators in the in the market, so it's it's a corrective measure uh, at a time when the economy is slowing down and the inflation is raining. Okay, so, Victor, uh, we will have yeah. to leave it there. Victor Tio, political scientist and Indo-Pacific affairs analyst in Singapore. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. For decades, the ancient town of Ahmadiyya in northern Iraq served as a testament to a rich history, untouched yet under threat. Nestled in the mountains, Ahmadiyya is an architectural gem filled with traces of its Assyrian, Yazidi, Jewish and Islamic heritage. But due to terror threats from the PKK, for many years it was closed off to the world. That's now changing. Obeda Hitto travelled to Ahmadiyya to bring us an exclusive look at its revival, the people who are returning and the visitors breathing new life into this once forgotten town. Perched atop a high plateau in Iraq's mountainous Duhok province, Ahmadiyya's stone houses and ancient architecture can be traced back five millennia. It's so authentic, so peaceful. There's still like realness in the world. It's not like influenced by the, it's still authentic. And the people in the houses, they come out from the house and they greet you. And they also, one had like a pomegranate tree and he told us we can pick up from his pomegranate. They were really nice. I didn't get a feeling of danger at all. This ancient town is experiencing a new chapter in its long history. Only a few years ago, the impact of the threat of terrorism drove hundreds of families from their homes, casting a dark shadow over life here. But now, with the area finally cleared of any immediate threats, Amidia has re-emerged, vibrant and welcoming. That's thanks to two main developments. Ongoing joint anti-terror operations between the Turkish military and the Kurdish regional government's Peshmerga forces as well as major investments by Erbil in critical infrastructure projects to serve both locals and tourists. The most important projects we are funding are a hospital we are building nearby and support for the many farmers here. So far we have spent nearly $268 million on completed projects. We're also building a new road which will pass through the town's historic sites. For example, it will be easier to reach the town centre from the Amidia Gate. We've also spent more than $5 million building a new university. While these investments are happening, the region is still facing the threat of terror attacks by the PKK, which is finding it more difficult to operate where they are not welcome. Unfortunately, in such a valuable region, the PKK is close. But the Kurdistan regional government's only goal in this regard is to provide a peaceful environment again and to rebuild many villages in the surrounding area for the welfare of our people. And as security returns, so do the people. Esmer Kudeida came to Ahmadiyya from Germany with her family. She left Iraq more than a decade ago but is excited to be back in this ancient town. I am Yazidi. I came here from Germany and I love Amidia very much. This place is the heirloom of our ancestors. This place gave me a lot of peace. For me, this place is more beautiful than Germany. 
Organizations like the PKK should not come here. Businesses, too, are seeing a turnaround. A local shop owner who calls himself Sheikh says his livelihood is now bolstered by the influx of tourists. Things have changed a lot. People are investing in tourism projects like hotels, cafes and shops like mine selling local sweets, foods and unique souvenirs. Slowly the tourism traffic is improving. Even as anti-terror efforts continue nearby, the ancient spirit of Ahmadiyya is heavily present. The town, once a casualty of conflict, is now a destination of peace and revival, a place where history and the people living in it can breathe freely once again. Obeidahito, TRT World, Ahmadiyya, Iraq. Well, that's all your business news for now. Thanks for watching. The news continues after next time.